Um, I found this process to be um, fascinating and filled with unknowable parts, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I knew we were going to have a workshop, thank you, um, but I didn't know anything about the dynamics of the space. I've been here before, but I didn't know what the layout was going to be. That, of course, is going to affect how we would do a workshop. I thought that maybe there'd be a long table and we'd be sitting around the table, or maybe we'd be sitting in a circle. Um, I didn't expect us to be sitting in this way. That's not a criticism. Rather, once I came in, there was almost immediately information, as you saw, information that I began to process. The last thing that I wanted to do was sit behind the table while we talk about workshops and your poetry. Um, because that's quite a bit of what we're going to talk about, I guess, kind of the invisible authorities that work their way into any type of teaching situation. Workshops are very different from seminars. Seminars, of course, are different from lectures, et cetera. Um, we talked to Christina about maybe doing a circle, maybe doing other options. But when we were talking about that, I found myself planted here. I actually tend to teach like this, and all of a sudden, a lot of quote unquote problems felt solved uh, to me. Because this, much like the Norton, right, has a kind of solidity to it, a materiality that um, identifies itself as a material of authority, but at the same time kind of distances and differentiates instructor from um, poet, right? Even when, we, when I teach a workshop, I call my students poets. When I send them emails, dear poets, right? Um, that's not to, to say that the learning is um, specialized in a way that should be um, qualitative, uh, but rather that you're, you're utilizing different intellectual and emotional muscles, obviously, when you're in a workshop. Um, so with that said, I'm very happy to be sitting right here now with you all on top of the table. And I'd like to, I'd like to lay out a few things for you. One, this is going to be a very informal talk, very informal. Um, not because my workshops are informal. My workshops are more informal than uh, my other classes. Um, and I want to honor the way that I teach a workshop and the way that I now talk about a workshop. To me, it would seem a little counterintuitive to the way that I do things to formalize a talk on workshops when my workshops tend to be informal. Um, that also leads, I think, for me to talk a little bit about where I come from in teaching workshops, because I'm a bit of a rare um, Avis, not too much, but um, I have a PhD. I don't have an MFA. My PhD is not in creative writing. It's in English. I have a meat and potatoes literary background. I wrote a dissertation. Most of my colleagues in graduate school, I would say, didn't even know that I wrote poems. Right? Uh, I took in my, in my career as a student one workshop my senior year, um, my senior year of college in the spring semester, I think. It's the only workshop I ever took. I tried when I was in graduate school to sit in on a workshop, but the professor of that workshop, Heather, kicked me out. <laughs> uh, and in kicking me out, he said to me, um, you don't need to be here. You should be in the library. You should be in the archives. That's your workshop. I tell you this not to um, diminish or question a workshop's value, but rather to let you know that as an instructor, that differentiates me in the following sense. I don't have any muscle memory when it comes to workshop that comes from earlier times. I have no bad experience or good experience. I'm no one's protege. So I tend to teach my workshop very much from a clean slate. It's very ab ovo. It, it just kind of comes out. That, um, I think, has more good parts than bad parts. Um, for me, the most important thing then in having a workshop, teaching a workshop, is not having a successful workshop, but having everyone prepared when they're finished to have a 
broader foundation for thinking about writing poems. So from my perspective, a workshop is counterintuitive to maybe your goal as a student. I would understand completely if you think, I'm hoping to come into this workshop and write some good poems. Or at least if I'm not writing, I hope that the poems that I have written are recognized as being good poems so that I know that I'm on the right direction to being a poet. I hope that my poems get better in the time that I'm in this workshop, right? Um, or I hope that I get told once and for all, like sometimes they do in movies or stories that I've read, you suck. So I know not to do this anymore, and I go into editing or something like that, right? These tend to be, these tend to be the avenues that we go in, right? We look for some type of validation, even though we don't say, I'm taking this workshop and I hope for some type of validation. You're certainly looking for some type of validation for the things that you are making. Um, part of me hopes when I teach a workshop um, that you end up with a number of um, really fussy works in process, right? Um, because I'm very skeptical of being able, in the context of a workshop, which is a shared experience, the whole point of a prompt is a shared experience. All of us now are going to spend a week doing this type of thing, and then the poems will be different. But the only reason why we have an ability to really kind of go into those poems in a given meeting is because we've had some form of shared experience, which is the prompt, right? Um, but what about after the prompt, right? I mean, there are going to be things about your poem that um, are speaking to things outside of the prompt, and maybe the poem that it becomes that publishable poem or that published poem or just that poem that you really like is outside of the prompt, right? So in a way, what we're doing in a workshop is tuning the piano, right? But we're not necessarily, um, we're not necessarily looking to play it. So a few things. One. When we talk about a workshop, we're actually talking about a genre, right? I mean, we're talking about a lyric poetry workshop, right? We don't do, are there any epic poetry workshops? I'm serious, <laughs> oh, that's not a rhetorical question, but are there? Are there any epic poetry workshops, right? I mean, you can maybe work on some lines from an epic or something like that, right? But even the idea of the space of, of a workshop is very difficult to come out with. Uh, is there, Katie, is there, yeah? You produce an epic workshop poem per per outing, per meeting. But are they are they epic poems or are they long poems? Like Lycidas is a long poem. It's not. But it's for the most part. It's for the, a, a, a workshop, for the most part, is a lyric experience, right? You know, please don't write more than 25 lines, <laughs> right? Um, you know, write your sonnets, write your villanelles, write your free verse poems, what have you. But the, the goal is to have a lyric uh, experience. Sometimes not, sometimes an epic experience. But, you know, we're dealing with lyric poems. In that sense, a workshop is, for the most part, actually dealing with a genre, right? Lyric. The funny thing about lyric is that, well, it depends on if you subscribe to this theory of the lyric, but we know from Mill, Mill the whole idea that a lyric can be spoken by anyone, right? A lyric is a poem, unless it's a dramatic monologue, that can be spoken by anyone, right? In that sense, then, you're trying to write a poem that is faithful to your voice, but has the capacity, the capaciousness to have another voice occupy. It seems, though, that when we're in a workshop, what we're doing as workshop students is somewhat um, antithetical to that, no? I mean, we're, we're working on what? Finding your voice, right? Finding your voice as though it's something that's real and can be reified, right? Um, sometimes, as you know, likely, there have been um, workshops where you basically submit things anonymously, right? This is done, I think, in some um, distance 
workshops, right, where you just kind of like send things for like your name and the professor splits them or whatever. But that's very difficult to do when you show up, right, and you face everyone. Um, but I very much like the idea, um, I don't do it all of the time, but I like the idea of um, everyone comes in with their poem and you switch up all of the poems and then you have everyone read a poem and talk about it. In a sense then, you're taking on a personality as though you have written this poem and the feedback goes to that person as though they have written that poem. Because if a lyric poem really works, the idea if you say she sang beyond the genius of the sea, the water never formed to mind or voice like a body, holy body fluttering in something, sea, that that's me saying that, right? It's a good line, right? And I'm saying it as though I'm there. Um, sometimes I really like the idea I don't want to say destabilizing because I think that sounds self-aggrandizing, but I think that a true lyric experience sometimes occurs on this level where you have another poem in front of you all of a sudden. The poem that you wrote, you're not responsible for. It's someone else's poem, and you're going to hear them read it, and you're going to hear them talk about it, and they are a persona, and you too are a persona. Now, perhaps this is cruel, and I'm, the whole talk is not going to be how I teach a workshop. I don't do this all of the time. Um, but I do, I do do it, and I really wanted to think about this in terms of, of thoughts regarding the workshop. When this is the assignment, I never tell them this is the assignment. Right? Um, so they come in with their poems, and then we switch them up. We also, I tend to do cold readings for, for a few reasons. Um, some of them have to do with art itself, but some of them is just logistical. When I first started at Stony Brook, I could have a workshop with six students, or eight students, or four students. But it got to the point, particularly when the budget started to tank, welcome to teaching at a, at a state school, where they needed the classes to have a large enrollment. So all of a sudden, I was teaching workshops where the expectation was that I would teach 12, 14, 16 students. Which is fine, but teaching, even when you meet for two hours and 50 minutes, three hours, it's very difficult to get to everyone's poem. Right? Um, I, I, I talk to my students about the best way to do things. I, I found sometimes that when we had the poems due a day before via Blackboard or what have you, the idea is that everyone has had the same experience. Everyone's poured over the poems, right? But there are times when that just doesn't happen for one reason or another, right? And I started to think, you know what? Let's do this cold. I trust my students. I trust that they read. They're reading all of the poem assignments. They come in prepared to think about poetry. They've had this shared experience, which is the prompt, or the free write, which itself is a type of shared experience. And we get at the poems cold. When they get at the poems cold, yes, the obvious benefit is, oh, you have visceral reactions to it or not. But it also, without the student knowing it, I think it prepares them for the letting go. First chill, then stupor, then letting go, right? So you come in, and everyone has their poem. And I say, OK, everyone pass your poems around. And then I mix them up, and I give everyone else their poem. And ah, I find it actually really refreshing to think about how a workshop can represent or be a mimicry of a lyric experience. And for me, that involves reading someone else's work as your own, thinking about the compositional elements of a poem as your own. Um, that, to me, brings in stakes which are um, useful because they're not prescribed. There are a lot of ways that we can think about how a workshop runs. I don't know if any of you saw what uh, The New Yorker published this week about Gordon Lish's workshops, right? And the whole thing about seduction. Oh, she would be sexy, right? You have to seduce the world. Um, I think it's very important in a workshop to have moments where you're not yourself, right? Where you are disaster disastrously not yourself. And I don't mean in the writing of the poem itself, but I mean in the actual classroom. Uh, setting. I teach um, history of the lyric. Basically, I'm comfortable going from early modern to contemporary. Um, I'll also teach on poetics, history of poetic criticism, translation, African American, Caribbean, 
uh, stuff as well. So I teach, I don't only teach writing classes, which means that I have students when they're in classrooms, and I also then have students when they're in workshops. And some of the work I find sometimes is getting students to loosen up. And I don't mean loosen up in the terms of like, oh, we're in a workshop. It's all loosey-goosey. Um, but thinking about stakes that are not kind of the allegorical good student, right? You know how to be a, how are you a good student in a workshop? How are you a good student in a workshop? What does a good student in a workshop do? Do they write really well? Do they respond to everyone's work really well? Do they evince an understanding of tradition really well? Do they have to do all three? How are you a good student? How would Louise Gluck be in a workshop as a student? Right? <laughs> um, so if, if I can prioritize something amongst us all here as we're talking about um, the workshop and how it works and everything like that, I, I, I would suggest that we go in, not in fear, but with a healthy skepticism of competence. I, I sincerely believe that our age in poetry, this age that we're in, will be known as the age of competence. <laughs> it's very easy to write competent poems. It's very easy to be a competent critic and reviewer. And it's very easy to receive in all more a certain amount of protection from being competent, right? You can build a career on competence, in part because if you're not careful, a workshop can encourage your competence, right? So if that is the goal, if we're then producing happy poetry students who say, you have to take this workshop, it's great. I write much better now, right? Or I wrote this poem and I got published there. That's all fine. But the more we live in an age that really um, has made the idea of the lyric subject a diaphanous thing that's almost not there, right? Due to the fact that the way we text and communicate now and everything like that, and even the idea of conceptual poetry and all of this, I think it's really, really important to um, not be a good workshop student. Now, I don't mean channeling your inner dead poet society. I don't mean being Rambo and being a complete like misanthrope. But I, I mean rather letting go of the idea. I mean letting go of the idea that your workshop experience is teleological. Because poetry is not teleological, right? This means, I think, having weeks, perhaps numerous weeks, where you get nothing out of a workshop. What do I mean by nothing out of a workshop? Sometimes, I, when I think about poetry, I, I live by the syllable, right? Sometimes it's really difficult to in the time that's allotted, let's say you have 16 students and you have two hours and 50 minutes. Let's say because of the way the class is, you need a break. Or even if you don't need a break, you're talking about maybe 10 minutes per student, right? What can you really do in 10 minutes? Well, you can address a poem. You can talk about the compositional aspects of it. The student can explain where they're coming from. Students can talk about what they like about it. Uh, a professor can reach in from the inside and pull it out, or we can just all praise it, or we can just all trash it. Those seem to be all fine options. They work. However, I really think that the best workshop experience leaves you with something that's tenuous, that you have to go back to. And I think it's very difficult to, one, teach students to have a workshop experience truly be, to truly be a springboard Right? What we're doing in this space, nothing really happens, right? Um, workshops make nothing happen, right, I guess. <laughs> but you have to be, you have to be willing, um, you 
have to be willing, I guess, to really um, spend time in the epilogue of the experience. My favorite Lowell poem is, is actually epilogue. And I'm somebody who really loves early Lowell. I love all that stuff, the Quaker Graveyard in Nantucket, all that Milton stuff. I love that. Um, but in a way, we are poor passing facts. I, I've actually said in print that I don't believe that line. But I think that for the workshop that I, I, I do, that it's really important for that to happen, that you kind of question your facticity, that you live by the syllable, by the breath, and that you think of the workshop moment as being what Charles Olson called um, poetry, the verb between two nouns. Right? In that sense, when you're workshopping, you're not necessarily engaged in an act of poesis, right? of making a poem. You're, you're instead engaged in the act of making a web, a fiber, um, that sutures and strengthens the muscle by which you will write later poems. Uh, there, was a, there, was, uh, there were copies of Donald Justice's poem, The Wall, on seats when you came in. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps you know this story, or some of you know this story. It's a real archetypal workshop story in Iowa. There I was in Iowa, <laughs> right? And it was when Berryman was there, and Lowell was there. Um, and Berryman taught a class that Justice, among other poets, was in. And Berryman, sitting at his desk, and he collected all the poems for, collected all the poems for the workshop, and he's kind of just making sure they're all there. And he gets to Justice's poem, The Wall, and he stops. And he starts to read through it. And he reads the whole thing. And then he says something to the effect of, it's not right for a person to have to read such a fine poem by a student at the start of class. <laughs> right? <laughs> and from there, Justice was anointed. I'm not speaking. I think Justice was a, a, a marvelous poet. Um, but I, I, I bring this up for two reasons. One, for the um, narrative form which poetic encounter can take in a workshop, right? I was going about the normal diurnal task of workshopping. And then, right, 20 minutes more or less, it was so great my happiness that I felt blessed and could bless, as Yeats said in Vacillation, right? Um, but I also wanted to point out, if you look at the poem, Berryman was, was knocked out by the first line and then the pause in the second, right? which he thought was, was stunning and masterful. But there are also things about this poem that actually encourage or fashion you to stop. It's a sonnet, right? You guys, if you're here, I imagine you spend a lot of time with poetry. You can scan a sonnet really quickly and see something that is surprising. You can see the music that would catch you, draw you in to read more. Gates is later in the swan, a sudden blow, colon, the great wings flapping still. It's a colon after four syllables, right? It catches you, draws you in. So for a reader like Berryman, once there's always already a received form, a prompt, that moment is there waiting for you, right? So this narrative that's now, I think it's really a part of you know, American poetic history at this point, or at least kind of the, you know, post-war history, you know, workshops in Iowa and all this of poetic encounter, also is about, you know, the material of the lyric, right? The prefiguration of, of reading, right? And also the nature of prompts themselves, right? Maybe this would happen with William Carlos Williams's poem, because it's short and accessible. Maybe this would happen with Moore's The Fish, because it's so spectacular in its um, syllabic deployment. But I, I do want you to see the way in which the poem here is behaving itself, right? It's a perfect workshop moment. The form is prescribed and uber visual. It has a history to it, which makes any type of variation immediately recognizable, 
right? And of course, the topic itself means that you, can, you, you have the mise en scène already there, right? In that way, it's a poem that is an allegory of an effective, dare I say, great workshop poem. All of these things are buried under the surface, and I don't think very deeply under the surface, they're buried under the surface of this epiphany, which is not an epiphany of the poem, but it's an epiphany of the workshop instructor's encounter with the poem, right? And this, of course, not only um, affected Berriman, and it not only affected uh, Justice, but who else do you think that it affected? Who do you think it affected most that moment? Bingo. And there you have your hierarchy. This brings me to um, what I've really, I think we've been talking about from the beginning and why I would much rather sit here than sit behind the desk. Workshops should not have hierarchies, ever. Even if there's a student who writes a million times better than everyone else, a workshop must not have a hierarchy. When I was in when I was in grad, actually even before, even in undergrad, the, <sighs> most English majors have some aspiration to being writers, right? Some are told, no, 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 this really sucks, you suck. But they become professors, or they become editors, right? Or they just become great readers and lovers of the work. All of those people are incredibly important to a workshop. I would say that those people are even more important than discovering the great voice in the workshop. So the goal of a workshop is not to produce strong poets, nor is it to produce strong poems. It's to produce a foundation, right? Or at least extend a foundation through which people can imagine a shared experience in poetry. Right? I have a great editor. He loves poetry. The poetry makes no money at all for the house. But he really, really loves poetry. Right? You have to consider the fact that poetry only will thrive if we have workshops where everyone can want to be a poet. Everyone. Yes, there are too many poets. True. But that doesn't mean that we should kind of chop off the heads of those people who are not writing the great epic poem in the workshop. You're cool. It's like that moment in, um, what is it? Um, what's the name of that movie? Um, Dave Chappelle. I keep thinking Knocked Up. The weed movie where they're selling weed. No. Half baked, half baked, and the great quitting scene in the burger place. And he's like, you know, I, I quit. You suck, you suck, you suck, you suck. You're cool. You suck, you suck. I'm out of here. <laughs> so the guy who's writing the epic poems of the workshop, you're cool. I'm done. I'm out. No, but 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 seriously, but seriously, there's a way in which listen. Um, if you think about what I'm what I'm talking to you about. I think, I hope, it all makes sense when we're talking here, the poet sitting on the table and talking about all of this. But I want you to take a second and really think about your experience in the workshop and how what I'm saying could affect your experience in the workshop. You're all fantastic students, I'm sure. So you're also really good at taking in this type of information. Ah, that's interesting, right? But can you really be in a workshop with somebody else's poem? Right? Like really own somebody else's poem like your own? Because the idea, I think when we read, I've only conf confided this to a few poets. Maureen's actually one of them. But my, my level for loving a poem is not, oh, I love it. Or even I admire it. I think admire is under love. But it's I envy it. When you read a poem that you wish that you had written, there's nothing else like that. And that feeling is so rare. Not I like this poem, 
but you're almost mad that this person <laughs> wrote that poem and you did not write it. That, those are the deepest frequencies of poetic engagement, right? But before you even get to that, you have to, I think, be in other people's poems. You have to try them. You have to try them on. Um, and I think that that is a great counter against competence, right? Because you could be completely wrong about somebody's poem, what it's about, what its symbolism is about, right? But you have to put yourself in that momentary moment of being another lyric self. That, I think, is what really opens up possibility. And what I worry about with workshops, yes, even the workshops that I teach, is that by the fourth, fifth meeting, the anarchist is the anarchist. You know, the person's from a rural area is the person from a rural area. You know, the formless is the formless. And even if you give them prompts to shake it up, they are still themselves. Um, I think the best way to combat that is to go in for this type of anonymity, which is not anonymity. It's being someone, but not yourself, and trying to um, love that self, right? Love the place that welcomed you. Oh, God, I just quoted myself. I'm so, so sorry for that. Um, so the art of getting it wrong, I think, involves fracturing your idea of the ends of a workshop, right? I'm sure, for instance, no show of hands. Some of you came in with poems, right? I would think. No show of hands, you don't have to say anything. But I'm sure some of you came in with poems, right? We're going to workshop them. I'm going to tell you what I think about them. Um, you kind of take them out for a walk. And that's fine. And we will actually do uh, some of that. But I've gotten very, 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 very little out of the actual moment of being in a workshop. What I've gotten out of being in workshops is learning how to live in a community of other poets. For instance, do you read other people's work? Do you really read other people's work? Do you come in every workshop and go, oh, this is terrible? The same way they go, oh, I didn't study for that test, and you got a 99 or something like that. Oh, I just wrote this at the last second, right? What are the um, mechanisms that you have as a workshop student? You should know them, and you should kill them. <laughs> you want to kill the self, because the worst thing you can do, I've written a first book. It did all right. What am I going to do, write the same book again? Right? You have to be willing to kill the self. Can a workshop teach you how to do that? Does a workshop set you up for either veneration or being told clear that this is not your vocation? Right? Is there a betwixt and between there that works for you? Frost called betwixt and between the peril of hope, right? It sits right there betwixt between the orchard bare, the orchard green, right? But living in these spaces, these negative spaces, um, they're incredibly difficult. Um, and they can be frustrating. But I think that they're incredibly necessary, right? Um, the top, well, not the top MFA programs, but um, MFA programs, is anyone here in an MFA program at the moment? No, you're all you guys, right? MFA programs um, certainly set up hierarchies, right? Even if it's not in the day-to-day -day of a workshop, even by who, you, who, who, you, who you're doing your thesis with. These are very fraught moments. Is the big poet going to take you on? Do they say, well, I already have too many students, right? None of this has anything to do with writing a syllable of poetry. I hope that as I'm, I'm saying these things, that you, you take it that I'm not saying workshops don't work. I'm actually saying the opposite. I'm saying that workshops do work, but they work less when we're most ourselves. 
you have to recon you have to reconvene with yourself after a workshop. But you have to be very, very good at letting go of that self. Dickinson is a master of this. No one killed the self like Dickinson, right? Robert Hayden always said it's really important for a poet to switch the gender, right? Rich gives you this mid-poem in diving into the wreck, right? But these types of transformations, um, they're masterful from the outside. Um, but doing them, I hope, in a workshop can actually lead to some type of humane living because a lot of these types of masterful changes that we talk about from poets before us and some of them well before us came at great psychic cost, right? And I would like to think that in a workshop, you have a milieu in which you can practice doing this somewhat without that great psychic cost, right? Um, but what does this mean for the ambitious poet? Right? What does this mean for the ambitious poet? How do you let go of yourself or spend an entire semester going in and standing up for somebody else's work, right? Where maybe two or three of the workshops you feel like they didn't really address what you want to talk about with your own poem at all. How then does your ambition find a home for itself in that type of um, context? It doesn't. And it shouldn't. You should be very ambitious in your writing of poetry. Um, but I don't think that there's anything that really um, cradles ambition better than a good ear, right? Because, and Helen Venlo said this for a long time, and I dearly believe this, it's the poets who will decide. It's the poets who will decide. Yale Younger Poets from the 1980s. Go check them out. Crickets, right? Check out any hot anthology that came out in 1979, 1984, 1991. Just pick one, right? Find the youngest poet in the anthology. These types of things are incredibly humbling, right? Why? Well, because it shows you that um, taste change, crap happens, right? Uh, but ultimately, you have to be able to write poems that your ear is satisfied with. I mean, I think that happens in part by letting go, by really letting go, by having, had, having somebody else with that poem that you take to workshop reading it, right? In no way that you would read it pausing at line breaks where you wouldn't pause at, not being able to pronounce that great scientific word that you looked up in Google. That's perfect for this poem, right? They have no idea what all of your Google research was about. Um, but they are the reader, mon sombla, mon frere, right? Um, so, if the workshop does produce a type of useful, competence for you. I think that's very, that's very fun. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, and I'm certainly not trying to blow up the history of the workshop as we know it. There's been plenty of um, pieces trying to do that, and I'm sure talks as well. Um, but what I'm really talking about is um, treating a workshop really like what it is, which is a lyric experience, you notwithstanding. But it's a lyric, it's a lyric experience, right? We tend to treat it like odes. Odes tend to not have odes in the title, right? We just, but it's an ode, right? Back in the day, it was ode to something. This is an ode. Well, a, a workshop is a lyric experience. So why not go all in? I really like going all in. I'm a very straight shooter. I never say anything that I don't mean. Um, yeah, no, I don't say anything that I don't mean. <laughs> See, but I thought about it. I don't say anything that I don't mean. I don't, Katie. I don't say anything that I don't mean. Um, but there's, there's a way in which I, I wonder if we're, I wonder if we're being a little dishonest with the kind of um, genre neutral application of poetry workshop. We're thinking about lyric experiences. We're thinking about lyric readings. Um, but there's always this overwhelming presence, 
of the poet, reading their poem, and then discussing it, right? Or the instructor, lording over your poem, even when they try not to. When I teach my other classes, which actually helps me a lot with thinking about my workshop, for two reasons. Um, when, you're, when your poetry professor only teaches workshops, and there's like these submissions, and you really want to get in, when do you see your poetry professor, right? You hope that you get in, right? But when your poetry teacher teaches other classes, you could take another class with them and kind of at least talk with them somewhat, right? I, I like thinking that um, you can be accessible in this way. But I also find when I, when I teach my other classes, I don't want to lose the mic, I stray a lot. I'm all, I'm all over the place. So sometimes even if this were a classroom, I'd end up in that corner. Um, I do that because that's just how I'm wired, but also because I'm very, I'm very much interested in students having conversation between themselves. This tends to happen a lot in classrooms, right? Um, you've made a comment, and you would like to respond to that comment, right? And in the response, everyone's looking at me to see how I'm taking in that comment. Right? So sometimes I have a habit of just floating out of the way. Right? It's kind of like I'm the control variable and I remove myself, face each other, talk to one another. I find it telling that in a workshop you really can't do that, particularly when we have this more intimate experience. Right? I went to Swarthmore College. You can't get more intimate than that. There are like seven people there. Right? <laughs> but you know, we're going to sit at a table. And we're all going to be together, right? And it's very intimate. But at the same time, if you think about it, it really, no matter how much we try to think that we're destabilizing it, we're really even more present as authority figures than when we're behind a dais, right? Why? Because there's no place to go. As someone who likes to end up in a corner, right? And everybody, after a while, realizes they shouldn't be like this. So they're like this, right? And kind of class goes on. But there's nowhere to. There's nowhere to be, right? There you, there you are, right? With your notes and everything like that. So I kind of find that fascinating in that um, the paradox is that we are bringing down the volume a little bit. But just in, I think, that proximity, we also um, bring it up somewhat. How are we on time, by the way? I don't even know how long this is supposed to go. It's five or seven. <laughs> oh, really? OK, good. Well, listen, a couple of things. One, you're getting up like I've, I've still I've got a lot more to say. Um, does anyone, I'll see you at Hunter. We went to the same high school. Go Hunter. Um, I'm really curious what, what we're not going to do the following. We're not going to do what I'm talking about now. Because it's act, it would be enacting absolutely the opposite of what I'm saying, which is that you come in with this idea that we're having a normal experience and it's switched, right? It would get very kind of performative, right? Kind of almost like an allegorical mask at that point. Um, but I am really um, interested in, for the last 10 minutes, opening it up and talking about this. Um, I really feel as though the ends of a workshop should be negative in their capability. Um, and I think we should go in fear of competence. I don't feel as though my job is to teach you to be competent. I feel like I'm not doing my job if I teach you to be competent. But the way in which that's enacted is by having real stakes in your poetry. And I think that the best way that you have stakes in your poetry is by having someone else have your poetry. Right? At some point, if you want to feed your ambition, an editor will have your poetry. Right? Or your, your grandmother will have your poetry and go, what's this about? Right? But you, 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 know, you, have to let, you have to let go of your poetry. And I feel as though workshops often teach you the opposite, to hold on to your poetry and make it better. Right? Um, but I like the idea of, from the beginning, knowing that you're letting it go, because then you're more in the genre that you're in, which is lyric, right? 
you're speaking as someone else, you're living in another voice, and, um, and I think that that's really a way of thinking to revitalize the workshop experience by making it kind of more of a crystalline lyric experience. What do you think? Yeah, well, you know, the funny thing is that um, there's such a disconnect between Eliot's criticism and his poetry, right? It's kind of like wish, wish fulfillment or wishful thinking. Um, but the, I mean, the way that the workshop activates, I think, typically is that we are mm. eavesdroppers, right? I mean, when we are, when it's not our turn, we are the eavesdroppers. We're a type of privileged eavesdropper, right? And that we, we then get the notes, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I, I, I think what's really useful about thinking about the lyric experience not as being eavesdropping is to think about the capability and the potentiality that, that it has in terms of diversity, right? I think that what's, what can be and should be wonderful about the lyric, the lyric experience of someone else speaking as someone else, is that when you read, um, a poem by a woman, a poem by an African American, a poem by a Latina, you are that person. Or you should be willing to be that person. Mm -hmm. I was asked by the Poetry Society of America last year, um, what's African American about African American poetry? And my answer was the reader, mm -hmm. period, right? If you are not an African American, you read African American poetry, right? If you do not take on the positionality of that lyric spirit, if you don't go all in in the lyric subjectivity, then I think that we're not um, being as humane as we have the potential to be. Poetry can take care of itself. If it does not want you to be that person, it has ways to make you not be that person, right? I am a, I am a homicidal duke, right? All right, so that's not me. Poetry can take care of itself, but when poetry is, quote unquote, purely lyric, it's giving us opportunities to really, I think, um, think about our differences in ways that are open-ended and, and humane, much more than being prescriptive in, in kind of anthologizing and catalog cataloging these groups that we then kind of track by numbers or the sex like that. Mm -hmm. The greatness of poetry in terms of this kind of pluralistic, globalized world that we live in now should be that there are not eavesdroppers, but rather that you're willing to embody a persona, right? With the fraught limitations of that, of course. But a poem's not a real thing, right? Um, <laughs> is it, what? It's oh, not. I just mean I just devoted my life to something that's not real. But you know what? <laughs> Try to take all your money out of the bank. That's not real either, right? I mean, we sometimes kind of like localize poetry or literature as doing this thing, but like, if any of your parents tried to take out all their money out of a bank, my mother's a banker. It's not fair for the most part. I mean, money only exists when you have it, but there, there are ways in which money also does not exist. Um, but we're kind of trained to kind of, you know, flagellate ourselves with this, but it's, it's, we deal in the breath, and anything that's living also deals in that. I think we just need to be a lot more unapologetic about that, um, and that's what I. That's what I. That's that's what I try to do. That's what I love about um, the lyric. But a poem should set us up as an eavesdropper. One of my favorite poems, Frost at Midnight. What I love about it is the eavesdropper of the eavesdropper. And Coleridge even mentions the eve, right, and the shadow. Um, 
But it's a poem where he's talking about Harley. So he's kind of eavesdropping on, her, on the breathing of her. And we can either be that eavesdropper so that we have these concentric circles of witnessing, or we can risk swimming into the middle of that concentric circle, which is far more beautiful because then instead of witnessing blessing, we can bless. Therefore, all seasons shall be sweet to thee. I mean, that's what a beautiful thing to say to someone. Um, that's this. There's so much more to address with that, but I, I, um, I think that's what I've got at the moment. Hey. Okay, so um, you were like really strong about this idea that there shouldn't be any hierarchy in a workshop, right? Among the students. Oh, no, but for, uh, 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 actually when you said that, you didn't say that because you were like, oh, I'm not going to be behind the desk like the Northern Anthology, I'm on the desk. So there's no, no, but when I mentioned hierarchy specifically, I was, I, I, that was right after talking about justice in that okay. poem and how that sets up a hierarchy because the other students go, oh, damn, Berman stopped what he was doing. Okay, right. When um, I was talking about that, I was talking about authority. I got you. Okay. So workshop, I think of workshop when I think of like something like uh, Leonardo da Vinci's workshop and like there's different people working and there, there's this one guy who knows how to draw heads or something you know and like there's another guy who can only like fill in robes because he doesn't know how to draw heads and feet yet you know mm -hmm. and I feel like I feel like there is an or when you say you live by the syllable I feel like there's an oral science behind this there's actually there's actually, when you spend two months making your first draft sound um, seamless, there's something that you're doing there that has to do with sound and silence. They're, they're, they're materials, and you're learning how they're very mm -hmm. um, lightweight yeah. and ephemeral materials, but you're working with those materials. Yeah, absolutely. And in that class, there's some people who can do the oral equivalent of draw heads, and there's some people who can't do that, who are like just filling in the ropes. There's, there's an arcane skill and science in this field that we're in. So how do you reconcile that with saying that there shouldn't be any hierarchy? Some people are better at it, you know, or, they, or they know how to do certain things. Well, because those are things you can deal with with a student outside of the workshop. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that a workshop, I don't think that a workshop exists to tell someone. In a workshop, or you don't think you should try to teach it in a workshop. What is the it? How to work with sound, sense, and silence to get the effect that, um, that create a transformation on the um, psyche and physiognomy of the listener. Yeah, I mean, you work on that in every workshop. Yeah. But there's a hierarchy in what people know then. Yeah, but who cares? Okay. I mean, yeah, but you know, who you know, <laughs> who cares? I don't care. I'm tall. I don't care. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like it I doesn't mean, it care. doesn't matter. When I have to read like a whole magazine full of stuff where no one knows it, and I feel like they're not even playing by the rules of that game. I feel like um, I wish someone told them along the way that they weren't even in the ballpark. Well, let's put it this way. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you who's a better poet? Pope, Marvell, or Dryden? Um, Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? I really, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't care. I really, okay. I mean, I don't. I, I, uh -huh. I, I don't. They have different strengths. Okay. They have different strengths that are teachable, mm -hmm. right? Or, and I mean to students, but also to other artists. But I'm just, I'm not a comparativist. I don't do comparison. I don't even compare like, like, athletes or things like that. I just, I don't yeah, deal with yeah. that. Every, you can get something out of everything that you read and deal with. Yeah. Everything's a teaching moment. I just don't do hierarchies. You will never hear me say who my favorite poets are or who my influences are because you learn a lot when you have a favorite poet and they really disappoint you with some bad stuff. <laughs> and you learn a lot when you read something by a poet you didn't think much of and they have a brilliant line. And I think when you think about, oh, well, this is my favorite poet, or I don't like this poet, you just kind of like, you miss, you're not living by the syllable, because you don't have that, that, that real ability to you take in something that, like in a, yeah. right, yeah. so. Okay. All right. 
I guess I kind of wanted to respond that um, to that comment because I've been in a lot of workshops and the um, my worst one was one where there was a hierarchy and um, the problem with that I think to what uh, what's been said here about getting rid of yourself when you're in a workshop part of that comes um, part of that's also getting rid of judgment mm -hmm. and being oh well these are good qualities and these are not good qualities I mean in the even in the metaphor that you bring up with uh, da Vinci you know maybe the person who can't draw draw heads does incredibly good with like making color colors. or something like that absolutely and so yeah. Um, yeah the best workshops were one where poets were where maybe students had sort of a sense that there was someone who was um, better than than other people but there was still some poets where you just really envied like a particular line uh -huh. that they did really well and I think that the most successful workshops that I've been in has been one where every student has envied another person in the room and their qualities, and there wasn't a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that if you pretend that there's not, it's a shadow there? I mean, are people still thinking that way? I mean, I, I think that's the responsibility of the professor to break that down. I mean, it's, um, especially in academia, there's this hierarchy of intelligence that needs to be broken down. You know, some students make really amazing comments that bring in a certain life experience, and some students can make really amazing comments about the text. And when you start to narrow, yeah, yeah. yeah then you lose something in, in the whole like process of learning and knowledge. Quick analogy, very, very, very brief. Yeah. One summer, summer 1994, after my sophomore year, I think, uh, I worked in Jersey City doing conflict resolution. It was a program called Education Through Sports. Jersey City has a fine-tuned youth basketball program. Bobby Hurley's uh, father's been there forever. They win lots of state championships and all of that. So the path to becoming somebody, even if you don't go to UNC or wherever, is basketball, right? It creates social hierarchies and all of that. So what did we do? We created this camp where the sports that were played were ultimate and like European handball and things like that. <laughs> where all of a sudden with these different sports, what ended up happening? People who normally were not going to be good at all at basketball or something like that. They could throw a frisbee really well or things like that. And you'd be amazed how quickly the social hierarchy, it's not that it changed, that that person now was the alpha dog or whatever, but it destabilized, right? And so, yeah, I mean, if we embrace this thing of, oh, well, you know, it's a shadow it's there anyway, then we say, you know, people are homophobic, people are racist, anyway in their head, so why have laws about it? Why, you know what I mean? You have to, you, you, you have to create this type of, um, sphere in which you kind of go at that, but anyway. Hey. Well, I'm just curious, uh, it just seems to me, maybe it's just sort of, partly just sort of summing up, I think, but is, are you saying at one point that to be, almost to be a, a better workshop, whatever end you're on, in a, either the recipient or a leader, is also to be, is the learning to be a more fully engaged collaborator? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I think that's that's absolutely... It's absolutely true. And you have to also feel out of class. I mean, it can't be prescriptive, what I'm saying. I mean, you have to, so many things go into it, dynamics of the space, right. number of students that you have, all of that. But if you're open to that being your responsibility, you know when you walk into a space. When I walked into this space, the first thing I thought was, OK, I have to find a way to do this that works, right? But if you, if you have that as, as your main objective, I think the rest falls into place. Right. I think that's a really apt way of, of summing it up, yeah. Are you looking at me? Yeah. You are looking at me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, my gosh. Is something wrong with my eyes? My eyes. My eyes. Um, there's a really beautiful sense of what you're talking about, about a workshop not just being about preserving classic books of art, but about preserving person in a way, and a literary tradition. That's a great way to put it, also yeah, that's exactly. Preserving person. And so I wanted to ask you to just talk a little bit about what the workshop means in a world where people don't get to know literary traditions in college anymore. I mean, I'm not sure that they do, mm. you know. Or that the tradition's different, and maybe it should be. Well, that, um, I, lo I, I love, I, I love you bringing that up, because that, for me, I, I think, I've been at Stony Brook now for I think 11 years, so they're, they're maybe a little used to it, but you know, um, when you come into a class with a relatively young black guy and he's basically saying, okay, 
we're going to do x, y, and z, right? I have no prescriptive anything, right? So at one point, we're going through every form there is. We're looking at the first, um, we're looking at the first uh, villanelle, j'ai perdu ma totrelle, and things like that. You, you, as far as I'm concerned, you have to do the history of forms and traditions. I like to think, however, that in this day and age, that word doesn't scare you guys. It was scary for us. I went to grad school where the creative writing program and the PhD program were not anywhere near one another. Culture wars, postmodernism, you know, why should I learn Chaucer? All these things. It was really bad in the 90s. Really, really, really bad. I think that we've gotten, hopefully, past all of that and that you can be comfortable going through um, Chaucer at one moment and conceptualism the next. You should be because you all now in this day and age have the ability to um, absorb that without it being inherently political. Um, I, am, I find, you've actually gotten kind of to the heart of why I wanted to talk about this because um, I've also on occasion taught at a creative writing program, I won't mention the place, um, Columbia, but, <laughs> but um, where you can really spend a while looking for a poet who is familiar with poetry before 1955, which is terrifying and really surprising. Um, and I think that a lot of that has to do with this type of justice story that I'm talking about, the way in which um, from Iowa on, there's a sense of the effective workshop enacting a type of allegor allegorized reception of what is good, right? Um, and that's why if I say Buffalo, if I say Brown, if I say not as much Columbia, but if I say Buffalo, if I say Brown, if I say UVA, if I say Houston, you already have a sense of maybe the type of poem within the ballpark that you could possibly be getting, Iowa as well. And I don't think that you can have art prepare itself most effectively for the future without having a person, a human being, engage with what's come before them. What's difficult about that is teaching that in a way that is not um, conservative. I think it's because I think I completely understand a student feeling like, well, you're going to make me recite these 70 lines of Chaucer. That's like so, so I completely understand that. And so the goal, the task, is to have your workshop instructor be a successful collaborator. It's not that this is, this is boring but good for you. Or you should know your Virgil because Milton knew his Virgil. And you should write your own Lycidas. But rather because the, what's beautiful is, I tell my students this now, Katie. Think about how you're set up to be an insignificant writer, right? I don't like you. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love. Like, I wouldn't write that. Now, if I was talking about, say, same-sex marriage and I wanted to write an epithalamium, it would be like... It would flow, it would come from the heart, it would have feelings, right? Um, I would talk about texting, I would be in the moment, right? <laughs> you, young, you, you young people in the room know this better than anyone. Nothing sounds more corny than the language of its moment. Ten years I was going to say 20. <laughs> yeah, 10 years later, 15 years later, 30 years later. That stuff sounds really corny. Why would you want to write stuff that when your nieces or your children or whomever are taking a workshop in the future, they're like, wow, you wrote really corny stuff. Why do you want to do that? Why would you want to do that? Now, does that mean, therefore, you should write like Frost or a bishop? No, but it does mean that you have to be willing to, when you read Marvell, when you read Dryden, from Harmony, from Heavenly Harmony, this universal frame. Okay, when you read that type of stuff, that you can enjoy being in someone else's syllables and being in that contemporary moment of the voice, right? Without being able to do that, there is no contemporary moment. 
Which doesn't mean don't talk about Googling, which doesn't mean don't talk about stuff that's happening right now. But I think that we, the strength in engaging past forms and voices is, is an encounter with a reality that at its best, especially when you recite it, it feels like it's in its moment. So then when you write your epithalamium, that is at a same sex marriage, you feel the same of Shakespeare's uh, sonnet 116, which was not about that, but damn, it sounds like it could be. Love is not love which alters when an alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. That type of stuff that you find your present moment that feels that way. And I think it's impossible I think it's impossible to do that without dealing with, without really getting out of your time situation. You know what I mean? Like, really uh, difficult. And I think that, that forms, traditions are really useful in that sense because they form strategies of seeing how you deal with these shapes. You have the Petrarchan sonnet, right? You have Howard, you have Surrey's translations, you have Sidney's versions. But then you get to things like Robert Hayden's Those Winter Sundays, which is a wonderful anthologized poem. You probably all know it, Sundays too, my father got up early, etc. It's a sonnet. So all of a sudden you're like, whoa, this guy who grew up dirt poor in Paradise Valley in Detroit is writing this love poem, a sonnet, to his father, one black man to another, and talking about how I wish I knew those acts were love. There's nothing about sonnet in the poem. It doesn't look like, I mean, if, if your eyes train enough, it kind of looks like a sonnet, but it, it's broken in a way that the lines don't look, the, the two stanzas don't look like sonnets. It doesn't announce its sonnetness. But the sonnet is part of its language, right? This is a form of love. Those types of things are always available to you, and, and it's a wonderful way of preparing to be read by the poets who come next. I mean, the poets who come next will decide. No one who publishes you, no one who teaches you, no one. Really go read, or at least find, Yale Younger Poet Wins from the last like 30, 25 years, and all the hot anthologies that came out. It's very, very humbling, right? And I think it's humbling in a good way, but you have to write with as real a voice as you can find. And the only real voice in poetry, I think, is a voice that engages with its history, right? And, and I don't mean that in a conservative way, but I mean just, you know, you don't want to be writing poems with a small case I because you think a small case I is doing something. We've been there. <laughs> if you write with a small case I, that's fine, but don't think that it's doing some type of like, you know, interventive work because it's super old. One of the things I remember doing um, a while ago, in an early workshop, I wrote the red wheelbarrow on the, on the board. What years is this from? Well, this is one of those postmodern poems. You know, the formalist was like criticizing it being one of these like postmodern poems and all of this blah, 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 all these comments in there. 1923, right? If you are respectful of what's come before you, then you really know how to surprise. You really know what. Um, a break in the form is. You really know what a surprising voice is. And that's why it's, I think, essential. But what's difficult is doing that and not sounding, you know, like, you should eat this because it's good for you. But I think that you do it. I mean, you become that willing collaborator that you're, that you're talking about. And hopefully in the work itself, I mean, anyone reads your work, it's clear. Um, yeah, that that's really, that's really, it's really important. Anyone else? I just, um, just on a, for your personal writing, um, for the majority of your completed works, I wrote this down because I just don't want to mess up the question. Um, the beginnings were flash inspired or endlessly thinking, processed, mm -hmm. inspired for for your own personal works. Set of yeah. Well, which, which would it be? Are they, oh, did they come to you in a flash? Like, yes, that's a great notion. I'm going to stick with that. Oh, you mean the subjects themselves? Yes, oh. yes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I very rarely sit and say, I'm going to write a poem about X. 
there's usually some type of um, utterance that's in my head. I mean, I write because, I think this is really true, by the way. If you can quit, quit. I can't quit. I have these voices in my head. People say like, oh, are you an actor? You read so blah, blah, blah. The way that I read is what I hear in my head. Now, that doesn't mean that what I read is what I hear in my, oh, I heard that, let me transcribe it, right? There are poems that uh, I write it and then the, I see the poem in the poem and the, the, the second to last line becomes the first line of something else that's different. Um, but I like, I keep a notebook. I have my notebook here, actually. I keep a notebook, um, but I write almost entirely in my head. I'm an avid walker. I try to walk everywhere, and I write in my head. I'm always writing in my head, and I'm never really worried about writing down a line, because I feel like if it's good, if it's really good, you're going to remember it. Now, that doesn't mean, I mean, now sometimes a poem starts in my head, and I realize it's not just a line, but it's like lines. And sometimes now, it's 2014. I whip out my phone. I, I whip out my phone and I start, I open an email and da, da 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 and then I send it to myself and then I have something to work with. But I think the most important thing is capturing it and getting it down. The rest is work. Um, but I do, I mean, I, I think I mentioned something from Yeats's Vacillation earlier, but I think it's really um, uh, true. You know, 20 minutes more or less, it was so great, my happiness that I was blessed and could bless. Like, Things come to you in an inspiration, but the inspiration is not the poem. You know what I mean? The inspiration, the inspiration is the light in the lamp, but then you use the lamp to get somewhere, I hope, right? If not, it's just kind of like, look at this light in this lamp. Isn't that neat, right? <laughs> um, but I think the important thing is just getting it down. I email myself lines and everything like that, but I just really believe if it's a good line or a good set of lines, you know, it'll stick in your head. Like any of the poems that kind of like I sort of came to my head while we were talking, I never said I'm going to memorize these poems, but you read them so much and you live with all of the, that time of Shakespeare's 73rd sonnet, that time of year thou mayst me behold when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold. You know you have the moment, where, is it which or that? It's which. You know how you remember it's which? Because he went, which shake? You have this wonderful moment where all of a sudden you're kind of living with Shakespeare, right? Whereas, which shake? And not that shake. Which if you're reciting, that could come out and it's not like, eh, you're wrong. But you have this wonderful moment where you can kind of like remember this moment of getting that prepositional moment right, which could help you in whatever other type of poem. It seems like a small thing, but which shake against the cold does so much work. That shake against the cold is a completely different embodiment, like you're talking about the the sensorium, it's a different relationship to the sensorium. So, I don't know. Thanks so much, I mean, you guys are really fantastic. I'm sorry we didn't get to any of your poems, but that was kind of part of the point. So, um, forgive me, but maybe another time. This looks so great.